How does a country that once reverse engineered Soviet aircraft end up building something this agile, this advanced, this bold? Is this a warning shot across the Pacific? Or just Beijing showing off its engineering glow up? Was the J-10 really born from Chinese ingenuity? Or is there a skeleton or two in its design closet? Maybe even wearing an Israeli flag? Today, we're flying high with a jet that's been underestimated, underpowered, and under the radar. A fighter that went from meh to weight, it did what? Because here's the thing. When a nation builds a jet that can rival anyone and sells it at a price that makes even the Russians break into a cold sweat, it deserves a closer look. Welcome to the story of the vigorous dragon. Something that just might make you rethink everything you thought you knew about Chinese air power. It's 1981 and the Cold War is heating up yet again. And China's Air Force is stuck flying J-7S and J-8S, which are basically knockoffs of 1950 Soviet jets. Oh boy, this is just embarrassing. So, the PLAAF commander, whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce on this channel, goes to his higher-ups with a bold request. A new next-generation fighter jet. Something that's not imported and something that's not copied. Built in China from scratch. And shockingly, he gets the green light and 500 million yuan to kick it off. Three companies submit ideas. Shenyang offers a F-16 style jet while Hengdu pushes for a MiG-23 clone. But it's the Qing Aircraft Design Institute that wins with a bold delta wing design equipped with canards. It's very reminiscent of Sweden's SA Viggen. But you see, despite what many people think that China simply copied the European delta wing plus canards design, this wasn't really the case. It was Qingdu that previously developed an aircraft designated as J-9, a double Delta Plus canard single engine fighter that should have replaced the J-7 back in the day, but it was canceled in the 1980s. So when the next generation fighter was finally approved to be developed by Chengdu, the bones of a previously canceled J-9 project found a new life. And a hero jet has a hero engineer. Leading the charge was the engineer Song Wang Kong, a man who would go down as a legend in Chinese aviation. Their goal was simple, build China's first true modern fighter with cutting-edge aerodynamics, fly-by-wire controls, and their own engine, the WS-10. But this dream would face hurdle after hurdle. By the late 80s, development stalled, funding had dried up, political priorities had shifted, and China was in a crisis. Then in 1991, the Gulf War shocked the Chinese military leaders because American F-15s and F-16s were dominating Iraqi airspace. Suddenly, China's outdated jets seemed hopeless. To bridge the gap, the Chinese bought Soviet-made Su-27s. But soon enough, they also got the license to build them at home. And Shenyang, the other imported Chinese aircraft builder, was behind this task. Meanwhile, with renewed political capital, development of the J-10 surged again. A full-scale mock-up was built around 1991. But there was a massive problem. The WS-10 Miracle engine didn't work at all. It was unreliable, underpowered, and years behind schedule. The team would then turn to Russia and buy the AL-31 FN engine, the same ones that were being used in the Su-27, which would then be interchangeable for the J-11 as well. But this would change the jet's design. Engineers would need to redesign the airflow inlets, strengthen the airframe, and alter internal systems to accommodate this new Russian engine. Something that the engineers were able to do remarkably fast. So remarkably fast that, and now folks, this is where you have to put on your tinfoil hats, we need to investigate a curious theory that China's J-10 might be based on Israel's Lavi fighter. The Lavi cancelled in 1987, was a single-engine Delta canard jet funded by the Israelis to finally build their own fighter plane. And its resemblance to the J-10 is striking. Whilst there's no hard evidence of tech transfer, some analysts suggest that China may have received blueprints or guidance via intermediaries, if not straight spycraft. However, it is known that an Israeli delegation visited China in 1986 and discussed weapon sales and a transfer of technologies. The Chinese, impressed with the IDF performance during the 1982 Lebanon War, negotiated a license to build Israeli Python 3 missiles in the same time frame. So, it's not a far-fetched idea to think that the Israelis wanted to make a buck or two off their cancelled fighter program if they had an opportunity. 
They had all the blueprints and designs sitting around and were en route to get brand new American fighters. So why not just sell all of your hard work? Chengdu's designers deny this, of course, and Chinese officials argue that the similarities are natural for any aircraft chasing the same performance envelope, and that the J-10 is primarily an iteration of China's earlier J-9 effort, which of course is sort of plausible. But hey, just look at these two side by side. And of course, in the early 9S, China wasn't really the inventor as it is in 2025. Rather, they were a follower I bet watching this video today you want to test this aircraft yourself against other next jets? March 23rd, 1998. After nearly two decades of trials and redesigns, the prototype 10-01 lifts off the runway in Susan. Test pilot Li Chang makes the first flight. The sleek pale jet with its distinct delta canard silhouette cuts through the Chinese sky. This moment isn't just a test flight. It's a national milestone. For the first time, China had built a fourth-generation fighter capable of challenging its global peers. The J-10A entered service officially in 2004 and became operational in 2006 with the factories going on to churn out over 150 units of this early production model. These jets would go on to form the backbone of China's single-engine fighter fleet throughout the 2000s. They're fast, agile, and packed with modern sensors and avionics. Or are they? Because at first, the J-10 was really a mixed bag. It was still missing advanced electronics, advanced missiles, and precision air-to-ground weapons. But as China as a country started developing rapidly in the 21st century, the development of military hardware followed closely. Before the thunder came the whisper. While the J-10A was a respectable proof of concept, China knew that it wasn't enough. The world was moving on and so was the competition. Thus, the fighter didn't shout about a revolution, but quietly rewrote the rules of what a Chinese jet could be. Unveiled in 2008, but entering service only five years later, the J-10B was the bridge between old-school design and modern aerospace thinking. At first glance, the changes seem modest until you look closer. Now, this next part's going to be jargon deep, but you really need to understand why the J-10B was such a game share. The most eye-catching upgrade was a new diverterless supersonic inlet that replaced the older rectangular intake with a boundary layer diverter. Which sounds like a whole bunch of jargon, but this wasn't just for style because the DSI intakes reduced its radar cross-section, simplifying the airframe by eliminating moving parts and improved airflow at high speeds, making this thing stealthier and much faster. It was a clear sign that the Chinese aerodynamics were catching up with the West. And up front, the radar dome was reshaped, accommodating what is believed to be an active or passive electronically scanning radar array, likely the KJ-3A, which is a huge leap from the mechanically scanned radar of the J-10A. This has given the jet sharper eyes and better tracking for multiple targets, a must in modern air combat. And what I'm trying to get here, guys, is this jet may look old-fashioned, but inside it's got some technology that will make it go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the West. The J-10B also introduced a glass cockpit, digital displays, and improved hotels controls. The jet became a platform where a pilot workload was reduced. Its situational awareness was now finally a thing. The J-10B also began integrating more modern Chinese weapons. It could now fire the PL-12 Beyond Visual Range Missile, and it was also equipped for precision strike missions with satellite guided bombs and laser guided munitions. For the first time, the JTN wasn't just a fighter, it was a multi-role machine. And while the engine was still the trusty AL-31 from Russia, yes, that saga continues, the J-10B was designed with the WS-10 in mind. Yes, the same Chinese jet that up to this point still didn't work. The plan always was to drop the Russian tech. It just took a little bit longer than expected. And here's the huge twist in the story. Despite all of this, very few J-10BS were ever produced by the Chinese. Why? Because the B was sort of a test bed, a stepping stone. It let China work out all of the bugs in its new radar, air intake, and cockpit systems before mass-producing the even more advanced J-10. And once the J-10B proved that China could almost build a modern jet, it was time for the C version to take flight and claim the spotlight. The J-10C is the latest and greatest from the J-10 family, and was first flown in 2013, entering service three years later. So, it's a pretty new airplane. And after years of struggling, the Chinese finally made a good AESA radar called the KJ-10A and featured it on the J-10C. 
You see, right about the same time, the Chinese started implementing various AESA radars on their aircraft such as the J-16, J-11D, and J-15. And China started fielding new missiles as well, such as the short-range PL-10, comparable in performance to the AIM-9X. And whilst we mentioned that it could carry the aforementioned PL-12, the Chinese AM RAM, the Americans woke up one day to a shock. The J-10's most fearsome bite would come from the PL-15, a new long-range active radar guided missile with a range of over 200 kilometers. With ASA seeker radar and data link mid-course correction, it's one of the most dangerous BVR weapons flying today. It even outmatches the American AIM-120D in some key metrics and rivals Europe's Meteor missiles. Really leaving a lot of Western commentators to scratch their heads and wonder where did China come up with this. A plethora of air-to-ground weapons and targeting pods have also been developed over the years. So the J-10C became a true modern multi-role fighter that could at least in theory take on any opponent. So what's the catch? Why did nobody want this jet if it was so good? One word, the engine. Remember that engine that they were developing, the WS-10? Well, all this time J-10S flew with those Russian-made engines. And when it came to exporting this new amazing J-10Cs, the Russians would say no because the J-10C could endanger their own aircraft with Russian engines. So the J-10C was stuck until they could finally start flying with domestic engines called the WS-10B. But these really aren't great as well. Even though they matched their Russian counterparts when it came to thrust, the service life of 1,500 hours up to 2,400 hours is rather poor compared to the Western counterpart. But now with these engine shenanigans over, the Pakistanis, a traditional buyer of Chinese weapons, were allowed to buy that domestic version and order the J-10C in its export CE variant. And then in joint exercise with Thailand, J-10Cs proved to be more effective than Thai grip pawns and supposedly won simulated battles against the JS-39. And China started fielding new missiles as well, such as the short-range PL-10, comparable in performance to the AIM-9X. And whilst we mentioned that it could carry the aforementioned PL-12, the Chinese AM RAM, the Americans woke up one day to a shock, the J-10's most fearsome bite would come from the PL-15, a new long-range active radar guided missile with a range of over 200 kilometers. With ASA seeker radar and data link mid-course correction, it's one of the most dangerous BVR weapons flying today. It even outmatches the American AIM-120D in some key metrics and rivals Europe's Meteor missiles. Really leaving a lot of Western commentators to scratch their heads and wonder where did China come up with this. A plethora of air-to-ground weapons and targeting pods have also been developed over the years. So the J-10C became a true modern multi-role fighter that could at least in theory take on any opponent. So what's the catch? Why did nobody want this jet if it was so good? One word, the engine. Remember that engine that they were developing, the WS-10? Well, all this time J-10S flew with those Russian-made engines. And when it came to exporting this new amazing J-10Cs, the Russians would say no because the J-10C could endanger their own aircraft with Russian engines. So the J-10C was stuck until they could finally start flying with domestic engines called the WS-10B. But these really aren't great as well. Even though they matched their Russian counterparts when it came to thrust, the service life of 1,500 hours up to 2,400 hours is rather poor compared to the Western counterpart. But now with these engine shenanigans over, the Pakistanis, a traditional buyer of Chinese weapons, were allowed to buy that domestic version and order the J-10C in its export CE variant. And then in joint exercise with Thailand, J-10Cs proved to be more effective than Thai grip pawns and supposedly won simulated battles against the JS-39. Then it outperformed the People's Liberation Army Air Force Su-35S in a simulated BVR combat exercise, proving its technological supremacy with its new radar and the new missiles. Holy cow! So now it's even beating the Russian jets. It was time for the J-10 to shine on the market. But unexpectedly in 2025, Chenggu got something even better. May 2025. Tensions flare at the line of control in the disputed Kashmir region. A high-intensity air clash breaks out between India and Pakistan. This time Pakistani J-10CS take to the skies and arm to the teeth. Reports from Islamabad claim J-10S armed with PL-15s downed multiple Indian aircraft including a MiG-29 and more controversially a French Rafale. India denies it, but PL-15 Debrish is photographed and analyzed on Indian territory. So they definitely fired the missile and a jet definitely crashed. 
and photographed here are the remains of at least one Raphael, a Mirage and a MiG-29. And the rest is history. For the first time, the vigorous dragon has drawn blood. Whether or not a J-10 shot down one jet or more, and whether or not it was a European or a Russian, the fact remains China now has real-world combat data on its jet and its powerful missile. And that, my friends, is priceless. Some Western analysis now openly question how India or even Taiwan would fare against squadrons of J-10Cs supported by AWACS and integrated into radar networks. Not to mention the latest fifth-gen jets like the J-20 also leading the charge. And this has made the world take notice Egypt has now supposedly shown interest in buying the J-10CE as well even before recent events. And what makes the J-10 attractive is not only its performance or its combat record, but its price as well. Pakistan paid only around $75 million US per aircraft in a full package, which is significantly cheaper than any other options on the market. With the war in Ukraine turning a lot of traditional buyers of Russian weaponry elsewhere, the J-10 in China can take a significant share of the market. Today, over 350 J-10S serve in the Chinese Air Force and the Chinese Navy. It's a workhorse, a stepping stone, an evolution. It's not a stealth fighter like the J-20, and it's not heavy hitting as the J-16, but it's the fighter that taught China how to build jets on par with the West. Its amazing radar, its worked avionics, and its next-G missiles make it formidable, and it's still evolving. Future variants may include confirmable fuel tanks, new electronic warfare suites, and even integrated with drones in a two-seater variant. The J-10 doesn't breathe literal fire like it's named the Dragon. But when it launches a PL-15 beyond the horizon, that Dragon's roar isn't just noise. It's a statement. China no longer imitates, it innovates. And every time a J-10 takes off, the world takes notice, what do you think about this technology? Is it a game changer or just hype? Let me know in the comments. Support the channel with a like and subscribe, and share this with those who love the future of warfare.